the show starts in three, two, one, go. Good morning, Kane Sport. It's January the 3rd, 2023. I'm Gary Furman, the publisher of Canesport.com, joined once again by our manager together, Matt Shodell, as we discuss the news of the day, presented by Life Wallet, where the time is now to take charge of your personal health and Matt, I hope you recharge. We took, I don't know, I guess what about a 10 day or so hiatus from this show. Uh, give everybody time to recharge the batteries after a, a, a long year, long season. And now we are back. And uh, before we talk about the news of the day, I think there's a couple things that we should uh, touch on that have occurred over uh, the last 10 days or so, you know, since signing day. And, uh, you know, of course, there was the, non-signing of Cormani McLean and Miami's continued attempts over the next couple of days to try to get him to sign unsuccessful. Uh, we might add, which now takes us into all-star game uh, t- period. And Cormani McLean was at the Under Armour All-American game in Orlando and is still there as we speak and uh, shows up all decked out in Kane's gear. Okay, throwing up the U, but refusing to speak to anybody. And uh, to me, it was was just a continuation of, you know, the total crap show uh, that we've been witnessing uh, when it comes to his one off uh, situation as it pertains to Miami's recruiting. And every other kid, Matt, signed as they were scheduled to, had the right things to say. And Cormani and his family have chosen this sideshow. And uh, I taped actually an inside scoop segment with uh, on three's Josh Newberg yesterday, which is on the website today. And uh, we talked about that as well. But uh, when we touched on the Cormani situation and I pointed out that through all the years that we've been doing this, that these types of scenarios very rarely end well. Uh, So your, your thoughts just on how you've been watching it unfold. Well, uh, first of all, you can't you can't judge this in the uh, the history of of time because it's a whole different scenario. I mean, at the end of the day, if Miami comes up with a financial package that's better than everyone else's, he'll, he'll be a hurricane. I, I can't tell you how interesting this whole situation is because fans apparently don't even want to hear about it. When we post, I posted some updates right around the new year. I talked. To, I mean, there were rumors everywhere. So first we shot down the rumor that it was academic because players have signed that weren't qualified. You can sign if you're not qualified and then you get a sliding scale GPA score before you graduate, a sliding scale test score before you graduate. There was some crazy rumor out there. You, it's academics. Miami told them not to sign. Yeah, not true. No. Uh, then there was this thing that he's filming a documentary and he's not allowed to talk to any reporters. Okay, (laughs) which is fine, but I don't know why they wouldn't tell people that. The only reason that even came out into the public consciousness, and the reason I know this is because I talked to the people it came from, (laughs) okay? So there's a reporter who was covering the high school playoffs, went up to Carmani and started interviewing after one of the games. And uh, I talked to this reporter and he said that Carmani's mother all of a sudden rushed over. You can't talk to Carmani. We're doing a documentary. Okay. That was literally it. That that person, that reporter, told Larry Bluestein, and I'm mentioning Larry Bluestein's name because Larry already publicly said it. His name's out there. I don't want to put words in other reporters' mouths. Uh, but I spoke to the original reporter. I spoke to Larry. And Larry said he had no other information other than talking to the same original reporter I did when he went on some podcasts and started talking about it. And now everybody ran with that. Why are reporters bothering Cromani McLean? He's doing a documentary. Well, I talked to Larry. Larry hasn't seen any cameraman. And Larry knows high school football as well as anybody. He goes to everything. He hasn't seen a single camera following Cromani at anything other than one Under Armour practice where some young gentleman, according to Larry, had a camera like you or I would carry, you know, not a, uh, what I would call a professional camera, but like an iPhone or Larry's had a regular camera, whatever that means. Just following Cromani around a little bit. He doesn't know, nobody knows who this guy is. It was just one person. Is that the documentary maker? Is that, you know, is that Corbin in disguise? I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, The whole thing is crazy. But 
none of it really bothers me because it's something to write about, it's something to talk about. What bothers me is fans saying they don't want to hear about Cormani anymore. Uh, I don't understand. Like, recruiting, let's face it, recruiting is as much about entertainment as it is trying to get a good class. If fans don't want to hear things like this on the message boards and updates, hey, we just talked to these, here's what happened with the rumor with the academics. It's not true. Hey, here's where this whole thing about this documentary came from. It's just the mother saying this maybe just to get the reporter away from Cormani. And when I spoke to that reporter, by the way, he said it's very possible the mother just didn't want Cormani to talk and made this up. He would not rule that out because he's heard, he hasn't heard this from anybody else. Cormani won't say he's filming a documentary, okay? Um, but I, I don't know if fans are just sick of it, if fans, you know, fans like to just say, well, he's committed to Miami, why are we even talking about it? Well, we've seen players committed to Miami and these sorts of things happen. And like Gary said, sometimes it doesn't work out great, which is why we're trying to report on it. And there's a couple of sources uh, that are close to Cormani that I've reached out to and bothered way too much at the end of the year to the point that I have not even reached out to them the last, let's say January 3rd, I haven't reached out to them the last three days, honestly, to even check in. I, I assume school will be back in session at some point. Cormani can't do anything. The funny thing is another reporter told me that Cormani told him he's going to announce a decision January 15th. And he's going to sign January 15th. Like Cormani, whatever he, I don't know if he wrote it on a piece of paper because he's not allowed to talk, but he told somebody, I will be signing January 15th, which actually is not possible. I mean, it, it's, it's like me saying that I'm not going to have a chai latte at 4 p.m. every day. It's just not possible. I'm going to have my chai latte, okay? Nobody can stop me. Cormani can sign a blank piece of paper and hold it up. It has, like a financial as that that about, it has about a, as much value as the 150 uh, Starbucks stars that I use at Starbucks. You know, it's imaginary, you know, because I, I have uh, not 150 stars left. So, <laughs> so it doesn't exist. Cormani can sign something, which is called, uh, oh my gosh. Uh, the, financial, the financial aid agreement. financial aid agreement, which he can yeah. sign, by the way, with 80 schools that day if he wants to. There's no limit on the it amount of financial enough. aid. To, and they're not binding, by the way. They're not binding whatsoever. It does allow you to go on campus more in, in certain periods of time. You're even allowed to work out there, depending on the situation. Whatever. I mean, you know, I know fans are overhearing about Cormani. I get it. But, like, you know, we haven't done this show in... I don't know. It feels like 10 years. <laughs> so listen, I would rather, uh, I mean, personally, I, I would rather have what happened on New Year's uh, Eve, which was having Miami not in a bowl game, which by the way, uh, on, the, on the positive note, you know, this is this, the second time since I think 2000, 2008 that Miami has not lost a bowl game, which is fabulous. <laughs> but I got stuck on New Year's Eve with a bunch of freaking Michigan people just watching. And, and look, I, I understand what happened to Michigan, but like just watching this game and, then, you know, like who wants to watch the end of the, the Michigan game with anybody who cares about football at this point? You know, like I'm over that. Miami fans don't want to watch anything. The only satisfaction I got was I eventually got so sick of that party. Actually, I didn't get sick of it. I, was, I wasn't forced to leave, but I sort of was because my wife has had a book club party we had to go to. <laughs> Her book club members were having a New Year's Eve party. That was so exciting, Gary. Um, we discussed the book. It was uh, it was a 19th century character piece, um, and it, it was just it was riveting, <laughs> riveting. But uh, but in this house, this is no surprise, right? The book club house we went to. I hope he's not watching this because for some reason, and this is what you expect from a book club person's house. The TV was probably a 32 inch TV, and they had crammed it into like the smallest side room in the house. And they had invited, as book club people do, all of the neighbors over. So there's just a bunch of strangers crammed around this little TV. One of these dudes is six foot six. I'm trying to peer over his shoulder to watch the end of the night game, you know, which ended right at midnight, by the way, which was a fantastic game. And uh, it, was, it was not a great New Year's for me. Not a great New Year's for Miami fans. Um, but uh, what was my original topic I was talking about <laughs> before I got sidetracked? Somehow this ties into Cromani. I didn't want to talk about Cromani. <laughs> yeah. So whatever. Anyway, I, I'm over it all. I'm over Cromani. I'm over all this. Like I'm just ready to move on. We're gonna be. You'll talk about this. We're gonna do a thirty for thirty thing. That's gonna be great. Not as good as the documentaries, but it's gonna be great in our own Kingsport kind of way. And uh, you know, let's just look to the future, people. That's what the thirty for thirty is gonna do. All right. Well, I, I think that not everybody 
is disinterested in Cormani, but I think that there's a lot of anger out there. I mean, Miami was about to celebrate maybe the best signing day in the history of the program, and only time can work that out, okay? Like, we could say that right now, but what really determines that is what these guys end up being a couple years down the road. But it's looking pretty positive in terms of the quality of the signing class. And you wake up signing day morning, and you're expecting to celebrate that. And one kid pulls, you know, just just pops the balloon, man. Like, takes sucks all the oxygen out of the room, kills all the euphoria, sends the Miami football program into scramble mode for 48 hours to try to get this signing done. It doesn't get done. And then everybody goes into a New Year's break feeling kind of down about the way things went. Instead of it being euphoric over the great accomplishments that they did have with the other kids to sign who were very good football players. So like, I get it. Like that's, it's annoying. I mean, I'm annoyed and, and we, we were watching and covering it. Uh, I'm annoyed for the people in the program because I know how hard they work. I know how passionate they've been about this recruiting effort and to have that done to them on signing day to me was not real cool, you know? And uh, I give Mario Cristobal a lot of credit. I would have dropped Cormani McLean in that moment. They have not. Okay, they will what, continue. What don't you understand about the word recruiting? I don't you care. Don't, Listen, don't I, have watched, I have watched this program go into the cesspool with culture and character issues. Okay. You know what's funny is even with NIL, I still hear from all these different people. They, you know, this school gave Cormani a car. That school's handing bags of, ca- bags of cash to Cormani. Like NIL is great, but you know, what do you, do you give the car back when you get this huge NIL deal? I, like, how does that work? I don't know. I mean, if, the car, if the car even exists. It's not inconceivable he got paid not to sign on signing day by yeah, yeah. by another school that wants more time to recruit him. Like, listen, you know, we want you to, you know, you know, we want you to, uh, you know, wait or whatever, you know, we'll give you X or, you know, whatever, not to sign and take some more time to think about it kind of thing. I mean, I don't think that's out of the question. Uh, some kind of you know, blind NIL promise or whatever, but I don't think this is about I mean, NIL. Well, you, you, it is about, of course, it's about NIL. And look, no, because think, I don't think Miami's being outbid or anything. Oh, like well, that. we'll see. You don't. Like, I don't think John Ruiz and the Miami Collective, if they're involved, are being outbid by the Alabama. Yeah, player. no, Miami would never be outbid by anybody for any player, Gary. But listen, the uh, the whole NIL situation. Uh, you know, when 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 this happens, right? It's Fans aren't used to it, and fans don't quite know how to respond. Some fans have said, this is great for Kamani. This is great for his family. Be happy for them, you know? To reporters like us, you know, when, if we put our reporter hat on, as reporters, we don't really understand the lack of communication, and fans don't like reporters. Fans have been taught the media is the enemy. Uh, you know, one of the first things I tell a recruit when I talk We're to them the We're not the enemy. Time, we come in peace. One of the first things I tell recruits the first time I ever talk to them uh, when they're in fourth grade I say, listen, I say, just so you know, the media is indeed the enemy, but I'm not. I'm I'm not the enemy. Everyone else, everyone else in the media is the enemy. You know, you can trust me. Tell me all your secrets. But the point is, there's a perception out there among just regular people that the media can't be trusted, that the media hounds people, that the media doesn't report accurately, which is difficult uh, to deal with as technically a reporter, I, I guess, uh, in some respects. <laughs> and when you put your reporter hat on and you see how Kermani has dealt with this, as a reporter, you're dismayed because the whole point of being a reporter covering recruiting is to bridge the gap between fan and player. That's all we are. We we are here to tell their story. And for a recruit to say, screw the fan, I don't have a story to tell them, I'm about the money, that's what bothers me as a reporter because I've always just sort of had my my mantra is, listen, I'm not here to tell your story for you. I'm here to translate your story to fans. Like, you tell me what's going on. You tell me what I can't say, what I can say. This is your story. You know, and there are plenty of things that will say, okay, listen, you don't want that out there now. I get it. You told it to me off the record. We'll keep it under the radar. And when you're ready, we'll report it. You know, that happens all the time. Uh, and, and we hold true to that. Okay, and that's why sometimes we do get beat on things that we knew about, and it is what it is. Like that's not the end of the world. I know for some reporters, uh, there was actually a famous story way back when. Was it with with Bernie Kosar? There was somebody. Were you around, Gary? I wasn't around, but there was some reporter locally who there was a. I think it was Bernie on a on a conference phone call back in those days, 
who said something that he didn't mean to. I don't know if it was about going pro early, whatever it was. And then he asked those three or four reporters, please don't say that, you know, publicly. And then one of them did and immediately got a promotion to some major other newspaper. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Was it Bernie or who was that? I don't remember, but I don't know. I don't remember the story. You don't know the story? Okay. It was before that, my time was told to me secondhand. I was not covering the team back then, but, you know, I'm not 95 years old like Gary. Uh, you know, I don't remember the the Fran Searchy, Kirchy, Ted Hendricks, Hendricks. I don't remember those days uh, like Gary does. But um, But the point is, it's difficult in this era to be a reporter because not only do the recruits sometimes – sort of say, I don't like reporters anymore. But the fans are now for the first time telling us, don't ask questions, let him be, which I've never seen before. And it's not just one fan, it's multiple fans on our board saying that, which is shocking to me and, and disheartening. All right, but uh, just to put the Cormani thing to bed, so he's in Orlando at the Under Armour game, not really wowing anybody, quite honestly. Uh, there there was one day he opted out of practice that said he had a shoulder injury, but you know, the, all, the Under Armour all American game is not going particularly well for whatever reason for Cormani. And uh, maybe he's distracted by all this nonsense and everything, but you know, it would have been nice to see it play out differently than how it's playing out. Let's put it that way. We will see where it goes from here uh, on the website. Well, as and by the way, multiple, multiple people who have covered recruiting for a while say they, would be surprised if Cormani winds up a Miami Hurricane just based on sources yeah. they have at other schools. Not from Cormani, because Cormani is not talking, okay? His mother's not talking to anybody. Based on, you know, other schools are told things by Cormani, by Cormani's mother, by people around Cormani. And you piece these pieces together, and some of the people who have connections with some of these other schools say, he's not coming to Miami, but we'll see. That's the information I have, Matt, from, you know, multiple places. But, but it can you know, change. It can change. I understand it could change, and that's why I'm not going crazy with it, right. you know? I think we just got to see how it how it plays out, you know, from from, from here. Sure. But right. uh, anyway, so it's been covered on the website. Uh, if you haven't seen the uh, the segment, the inside scoop segment uh, that I taped with Josh Newberg yesterday, that is still on the website, and you can check it out there. And we talk a little bit about Carmani McLean as well as several other issues uh, on that program. Uh, all right, Matt. So. Um, I want to talk also about a column that I wrote for the new year. Uh, as I was watching the Orange Bowl game, I was really struck by the story of the Tennessee Volunteers because uh, I thought it mirrors Miami quite a bit. You know, Josh Heifel goes in there as a new head coach. The program's an absolute... It doesn't mirror Miami because Miami hasn't won 12 games yet, bro. But... He, you hope he, it will. One year ahead. I know. I'm not predicting they're going to win. Oh, it's actually no. 11 games, but I'm not predicting that that's going to happen either. But here's where I think it mirrors Miami, if you would just not interrupt me. Okay. So Josh Heupel comes in very much like Mario Cristobal comes in and is taking over a, a train wreck. I mean, an absolute train wreck. Uh, you know, Tennessee hadn't won 11 games going all the way back, I think, to 2002. Uh, I mean, they, they, I think they, they went, uh, they went 20 and 27 in the four seasons before his arrival. Okay. Uh, now in year one, because of the offense that he was able to install and Josh Heifel is, um, a Mike Leach, uh, descendant and he runs a lot of those air raid concepts and it's a very, very good passing offense. And because of this offense that he brought to the table, they won seven games in year one. Miami under Mario Cristobal wins five games. But I still think there's parallels because it's programs that were in a really bad place that the new coach is coming in and trying to um, sort of revive. And Miami would have gotten the seven wins if they didn't have all the quarterback issues they had in the middle of the year and, and, and you know, the, those types of things that set them back without question. I think Miami probably would have been about a seven-win team this year. So – I see a lot of comparisons between Tennessee after year one of Josh Heupel and Miami after year one of Mario Cristobal with the Astros being Tennessee's a little was, was a little further along offensively. So now they take it to year two, just like Miami will be taking it to year two and they beat, you know, Clemson, they beat Alabama, uh, they beat Georgia, they beat teams that um, have been playing for the national title in six of the last seven national championship games. Okay. And they do this 
in year two of Josh Heupel. And, I, you know, Matt, I think that that is obviously just an unbelievable success story. But I see it as setting a target for, for Miami because they were doing And by the way, it was, it was Alabama, LSU, and Clemson, not Georgia. But um, they did it in Hard Rock Stadium. They capped the whole thing off in Hard Rock Stadium. And I saw some symbolism in that because I felt like Tennessee left town leaving a target for the Miami Hurricanes going into 2023. And I'm not suggesting that they can, you know, go get up to 11 wins this year. I mean, that's a pretty tough act to follow. But what it showed, Matt, is that it's it's possible, okay? It is possible. And you can look at TCU also making the national title game. It is possible to get this done. I mean, and, and you know how much effort Mario is going to be putting into this this year. But – you know, when he says there's no excuses, I think that was proven by Tennessee this year. Uh, there are no excuses. And, you know, there, there's nothing stopping a team from developing with the when, when you factor in the, the capabilities today of the transfer portal and uh, in particular from going from being, in this case, a seven-win team to an 11-win team. And why can't Miami go from being a five-win team that maybe could have been a six- or seven-win team to being a 10 or 11 win team too, if they take care of business the way the Tennessee did. Your thoughts? My thoughts is that uh, the new year is the same as the old year because if you, you wrote a great column, okay? You wrote a great column. You're a great writer. But if it was me writing it, I would have written the other side too. Like, hey, here's a team that went from five and six wins <laughs> to one and two wins. Because you know what? Any program can as easily point to an example where, oh my gosh, they were four and eight, five and seven, seven wins, then five wins like Tennessee did to go into 12 wins. As a team can go from seven or eight wins to five wins to two wins. So why don't you look at those examples and write those two? Why are you only looking at the glass half full, Furman? Look at the full picture. You always only look at half the damn picture. Okay? That's what they call it. They, now they I'm going to tell everybody a fun story. Don't interrupt me. Now I'm going to just change gears because this was fun. This was my New Year's gift to myself. I was charged by Gary Furman with chasing down a transfer portal story uh, just to see if he was actually getting looked at by Miami because we heard maybe he was. So I figured, you know what? Go to the source, talk to the kid. That's what we always do. Problem was, for whatever reason, the kid did not want to follow, or young man, sorry, did not want to follow me back on, uh, on Twitter to send him a nice little message. Uh, so I reached out to his former high school uh, to see if one of the coaches there maybe knew what was going on. Because a lot of times these guys are guided by a, a mentor. A high school coach might know the mentor, or sometimes the high school coach is the mentor. So I called Phoenix City Central High School in Alabama, Gary. And I said, uh, I called the main office, and I said, uh, you know, can you connect me to the, uh, to the football office or whatever? And uh, phone rings a couple of times. And uh, then I get somebody picks up and says, Patrick Nix speaking. I said, Patrick Nix speaking, huh? Uh, I said, do you remember me, Matt Shodella, Kane Sport? And he said, hello. <laughs> he didn't hang up. He didn't just Florence me. And I asked Patrick Nix, I said, hey, Patrick, how are things going? Uh, coach in high school. I didn't say coach in high school. He said, yeah, everything's fine. I said, uh, well, it would have been nice if you asked me how I'm doing too, which he didn't. I didn't <laughs> say that, but it would have been nice if he asked how I, you asked someone, how are you doing? You expect them to say, how are you doing? Like when you say, oh, you look so great. You know, you see someone at New Year's, you haven't seen them in a while. They've been hiding during COVID. Wow, you look great. And they say, thanks. Like, That's not for me, bro. I'm not going to be talking to you again the rest of the night, okay? Ask the other person, how you doing? Say to the other person, you look great too. That's common sense. Patrick Nix did not do that. But Patrick Nix, Patrick Nix did at least confirm in his usual monotone voice that he always used with us media people that uh, the transfer you sent me chasing was uh, was not going to be uh, somebody that Miami was chasing. So it were all worked out. It was a fantastic conversation. That was my New Year's gift to myself. Living in the past, talking to Patrick Nix. How about that? How about that? Well, two days. the reason I didn't go in the other direction that you might have gone in had you been writing the same thing. I would have not gone out. I would have done both. I would have said Miami no. could win 11, Miami could win two. Because they here's call the team it. that went from seven wins to two wins this year. Wasn't 22, 22 bad enough, Matt? I mean, seriously. Like, they call it a happy new year I, for a I've reason. talked to boosters. I've talked to players' parents on New Year's. And the, the line I had for all of them was, happy new year. This year can't be any worse than last year. <laughs> and they all agreed. They all agreed with that. Well, they call it happy new year for a reason. And uh, 
listen, I was, you know, trying to take a positive viewpoint of it, which I I do feel that they will be better this year. I think the O-line is going to be better. I think, you know, hopefully Tyler Van Dyke stays healthy this time around. They got they got more weapons on offense than they had at the beginning of last year. And the defense is, is uh, should also be better. So uh, hopefully, hopefully. Uh, so, you know, I don't, I don't think that's as, that's as definitive, but you know, the, the bottom line is there's things to be excited about and at least be optimistic about and hopeful about. And, uh, that was the mood I was trying to create. And I really did think that Tennessee, which proved that you can do this kind of set a target for the Canes. And, uh, you know, so, uh, check out the column, see what you guys think, post about it on the message boards. Uh, thought it was just something, you know, kind of cool to think about here as we go into a new year. All right. Um, there's several other stories, obviously, on the website today. But first, um, before we move forward, let's hear from our friends at LifeWallet. We here at LifeWallet take security very seriously. Our data security team is working constantly to make sure that your data is not accessed by anybody who you don't authorize. Hey, what's up, man? Yeah, I'm Excuse me, sir. Thank you. And uh, he's thanking him about it, and I'll be talking to CC. Well, we'll talk to you tomorrow. We use leading technology standards like biometric data to make sure that only you have access to your data and your identity is protected. LifeWallet gives you access to your entire medical history and information at the touch of your finger so that it can save you time and can save your life. Data transfer complete. Hey, uh, by the way, I know you want to toot Tennessee's horn. Do you know why Tennessee was so successful, by the way? Well, I know they won't tell you. you. You know, Tennessee coaches aren't going to say, here's the secret, here's how we did it. If you want to know how they did it, go onto the Tennessee website, which is, I believe it's TennesseeSucks.com, and go to their coaching staff. Go to their football coaching staff page. And underneath their football coaching staff, uh, you're going to notice something very, very, uh, very, I think very interesting. Uh, and what I find interesting, and by, and by the way, one of the coaches is Willie Martinez, um, former hurricane, but underneath the football coaching staff, you'll see something called 2022 football support staff. Okay. There are more than 50 people listed there. And these are not like, you know, secretaries or I don't know what you call secretaries or whatever. These are, I mean, you, I just go down some of these titles. Okay. Offensive analyst, director of football relations, director of sports nutrition, special teams, analyst, director of sports medicine, football, director of player personnel, director of recruiting, assistant director of football, sports performance, football technology, assistant, Assistant Director of Life Skills and Character Development. That would be my job. Defensive Graduate Assistant. Assistant Director of Football Ops. Offensive Graduate Assistant. Special Teams Graduate Assistant. Director of Equipment. On-campus Recruiting Coordinator. Content, that means there's an off-campus Recruiting Coordinator? That's illegal. Content Recruiter. Content Creator. Senior Defensive Analyst. Assistant Director of Football Sports Performance. Director of Internal and Advanced Scouting. Scouting Coordinator Offense. Assistant Director of Player Development. Assistant Athletic Trainer Football. Chief of Staff. Uh, scouting coordinator defense, defense graduate assistant, assist, I mean, I'm not even halfway through, director of player development, assistant director of football sports performance, director of scouting, defensive graduate assistant, director of football social media and creative strategy, associate athletics director for sports medicine, ass assistant director of sports medicine football, offensive analyst, executive assistant to the head coach, graphic designer, they do nothing, assistant director of equipment and apparel, sports technology coordinator football, director of com competition development, I mean, we need competition development at Miami, administrative assistant, that would be the one thing that I said earlier. On-campus recruiting coordinator, another one. Assistant director of equipment apparel. Assistant director of recruiting. Coordinator of recruiting operations. Assistant director of player development. Defensive graduate assistant. Senior offensive analyst. Offensive graduate assistant. Assistant director of football sports performance. And I said those fast and it took five minutes. That's how you win. When you have more people that you could fit into the heck center, constantly working and scouting opposing teams and doing recruiting work, and like doing all the little things that, you know, the position coaches and the head coach normally would have to spend time on every week. Instead, they're freed up to do all sorts of other things that you need. Uh, you know, I mean, that's how you, that's how you turn a program around when you have all capable people like that, those 50 plus people I just named, if they're all capable, 
that makes a huge difference in a program. And in two years, people like that, if they're capable, will help you turn a program around. And they'll never tell you that uh, other than maybe saying, yeah, that's really nice to have a lot of good people around. But I mean, go I on don't know that Miami, that. I don't know that Miami has quite that many No, as, as, no. as what you just you peeled off. But they have a lot more than what are listed in the staff directory of the athletic. Well, department. there may be more than that's listed too. Those are just the ones listed. Those yeah. are people with real titles. They probably but, have assistance under them. I mean, it could be overkill. I mean, at times, I think at times you might have people, you know, kind of bumping into each other. But, but uh, it does help to have manpower. This is a 365 day a year operation, and uh, you know, w- without without question, all the help you can get uh, certainly applies. All right, Matt. Uh, I mean, you, 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 the, I mean, look, you go to you, you know, you go to Miami's page, and it just says Alonzo Highsmith. That's it. <laughs> That's the only person who works in the building. <laughs> no, there's not a lot. There's not a lot. I didn't count it up, but it's, I think it's like 20 or something. You know, it's a big difference. All right, let's talk about a few other things going on that are going to be on the website today. You mentioned the 30 for 30 series that we're starting, and uh, it's taking a look at the at 30 returning players. They're going to form the foundation of the football team. In well, this hold, on, hold on. Uh, okay. I came up with the idea. You're describing it incorrectly. Okay. Then go ahead and describe it properly. What do you want? What do you want from me, bro? You know what? You should have said to me, it was your idea. Please describe it to everybody. Instead, you just totally misappropriated everything. uh, I hope everybody's missed this show as much as I have. This this is like, this is a priceless way to start. This is like I go in to get my my iced chai latte and they give me a cinnamon bun instead. It just doesn't make any sense. Why would you, why would you steal that from me? Why right, me, my I came with this great 30 for 30 idea. The right, idea let, me, is, let me start over. Let me start over. All right, Matt, let's shift gears here. You came up with this phenomenal idea for this new 30 for 30 series that we are going to be running over the next 30 days and give everybody all kinds of insight into the foundation piece of the 2023 Miami Hurricanes. Why don't you go ahead and tell everybody all about it? Yeah, I don't I don't remember what it was. I'll, I'll, have, to, I'll have to look at it and get back to you. I, I'm trying to remember. All right, so listen, the 30 for 30, which I thought was a brilliant idea. Brilliant. Is, okay, it's not returning players. It's the top 30 players on the roster that have played 30 or more reps of college football. So it can include transfers, okay? And, um, we, you know, I wrote the introductory column today, but I, I found it very interesting. I don't have it in front of me. But I think at the end of the day, there was like 42, 40 of the 82 players or less than that. Uh, but somewhere around 40 of the 82 players currently listed as scholarship players on the roster have played 30 or more reps of college football. That's less than, it was definitely less than half the roster. And then you, and then five or six of those guys have played under 80 reps. Uh, so it's just a really, really thin roster when it comes to any level of meaningful experience, uh, based on mainly on last year's reps, uh, but, you know, we're, we're going to rank the top 30, and Gary and I later today will actually hopefully finalize those 30 because I sent it to him yesterday, and he still hasn't got it back to me to say, okay, this is a good list of 30 guys, Matt. Uh, so we'll see. But but I find it interesting. You know, uh, one of the guys – I pointed out two guys in the story that uh, I think it was Jaleel Skinner I'm putting in the top 20, and uh, I think it was Colby Young I put in the top 10. And my point's this. How many programs that win championships or compete for championships would have Colby Young with a Juco guy who played maybe half the season, had a couple of really good games, three really good games in the top 10? How many top programs nationally would have Jaleel Skinner in his second year, a guy who really can't hold on to the football that well uh, in the top 20? But this, they're legitimately in those spots just because there's just not a lot of guys you can say, you know, you got the Cam Kinchins. And, you know, the, the James Williams and the Akeem Mesidors and, you know, a few guys like that, but not a, a handful, you know, handful, those handful. are championship guys. But but the really, really, really great teams, uh, they have like, you know, 10 to 15 of those guys. You know, it's hard to win at a national level with five of those guys. Can you do it in a weak ACC? Yeah. But now next year, we got to deal with the whole ACC. You know, it's not just, hey, we just got to be better than North Carolina and Pitt. And maybe some other school that comes along that's halfway decent. Now you got to be better than, you know, you got to be in the top two, including Clemson, a, a resurgent FSU team, you know, NC State, Wake Forest, and whoever else happens to be good, the North Carolinas or Pitts. I mean, it's going to be a major challenge with this roster that we're pointing out over the next month, going one by one through these 30 guys that are the top returners. P- 
people can say, oh, but all the freshmen, top five class, it takes time. It takes time. They don't just show up and they're stars. Some of them do, especially the skill positions. But when you're five stars on the offensive line, they're really going to dominate in a couple of years, to be fair. It's very difficult to expect even a Samson Okanlola or, or a Maui Go, Francis Maui Goa to come in and just dominate from day one because they're playing guys that are four and five years older that have developed different skill sets that you need in college. It's, it's not just in high school. When you watch Samson Okanlola's film, they're not playing the same level of talent as an IMG. He's just bullying guys. You can't do that all the time, depending who you're going against at Miami's level. So there's gonna be, there's a growth process. So it'd be nice to say, well, for the freshmen, plus those ten guys or five guys, great. But it's it's just I'm asking for patience from the Miami fan base. Somebody was fighting with me, Matt, on the YouTube channel last night, um, basically, you know, saying I'm clueless. You know, what else is new? Uh, uh, in re- relation to Reuben Bain and their expectation that Reuben Bain is just going to walk into college football and be a dominant player from the second he arrives on campus. And uh, like people don't understand how improbable that is. Like, you know, he he's an undersized defensive lineman for college football. He's got amazing skill. They're going to have to figure out what his wheelhouse is. But the chances that he comes in as a true freshman next year and is dominant at the defensive end position and just smacks everybody to the side, you know, Mesador, Jafari Harvey, Chance Williams, uh, Nigel Lee Kelly, Osiris Moss, who has great physical skills as well, who now has had a year uh, at that point in a strength and conditioning program. The chances that Ruben Bain just walks on campus and smacks all these guys aside, it's just not real real good. And, and that's the, the bottom line. And, you know, it, it, it's easy to come to our YouTube channel with a submachine gun, you know, and try to put, you know, bullet holes in, you know, us, you know, I'll attach you to this since you're on, on our YouTube channel. I don't want a bullet lot. holes. <laughs> just, just Gary. Well, this is not my idea. No. I mean, every, every now and then somebody will try to poke holes into what you're saying as well. And, and certainly what we're saying is not gospel by any stretch. We're here giving opinions, but um, I just, you know, in this case, I mean, the chances of that happening are just not real, real high. Okay. And so you might, just, I mean, you can come at us. That's part of the fun, but maybe just with a little less, uh, you know, force because uh, in the, you know, I mean, it's just not real high probability that that's going to happen. But anyway, so yes, it was a great idea by Matt. Uh, we launched it today with an overview, look at it, and we will be bringing you these breakdowns um, as we move forward over the next month. But we're looking ahead in that case to a, two games to, and a sport that's not going to begin for eight, nine months. What we have going right now, Matt, is an absolutely unbelievable basketball season by Jim Laranega yet again. And it's time that we keep heightening awareness of this because – it's, it's just an absolutely amazing story. And, um, you know, I was looking at something. Do you know that Miami, in its last three ACC games, has scored 42 fast break points and has not given up a single fast break point, which means they are doing an unbelievable job of not turning the ball over and getting back on defense. And it's just one of a many, many, many. Like, that's just a simple stat that would get overlooked. Matt, this basketball season so far is unbelievable. Uh, they are at the top of the ACC. Uh, we take a look at it this, this morning. Uh, your your thoughts on that? Uh, again, you're just uh, deluded. This is not unbelievable. This is totally believable. You are one of these media members who just doesn't have faith in a program that has consistently shown everybody that it's an undervalued team. If you take out, I did this research, it's in the story, okay? If you take out those three years where Miami had a losing record, which you rightfully can blame on the FBI investigation and losing two recruiting classes, basically. If you take out those three years, every single other one of Jim Laranega's 12 years, Miami was picked to finish in a, in a position that was worse by the ACC media in the preseason than what they wound up. Every single other year, every other of those nine years, they were picked to finish you know, ninth and they finished fourth, eighth and they finished first, whatever it was. And and we broke it down. I break it down literally by year so you can see it. Gary Furman apparently agrees with them because he thinks it's, un- it's unbelievable what they've done. It's totally believable. This is a top two to three ACC team. It has been 
pretty much every year they've had a full roster. I'd say top four. Consistently they've top played, four. They've always played Duke tough. They've always played North Carolina tough. People Virginia. just don't want to give them their due. It's just another North normal Carolina, year. Virginia, it's another, Miami. It's another normal year for the Miami Hurricanes basketball program. People keep on seeming like it's amazing. Oh, what a, what an amazing season. Every year they have, they do really well. It's just another great year. Enjoy it. Embrace oh, it. But what's amazing is is the way they manage to, to pe- bring these teams together. Like they're not recruiting at the top level like Carolina and Duke are. You know, just five star commitment after five star commitment. They are kind of piecing these teams together, hodgepodge, and just like ama- it is amazing. I mean, I'm sorry, you know, to to go get a uh, Norchad or Omir uh, out of Arkansas State and now suddenly have this beast in the middle, um, a kid that. Might have gone to Miami from the beginning. I mean, his mentor is Art Alvarez, who has fed a lot of players to Miami, but uh, through various circumstances, that didn't happen. So he goes to Arkansas State, develops into this beast, and now comes back to Miami. Um, you know, that's incredible. Jordan Miller, who's a great player, comes here as a transfer um, from George Mason. Uh, and then, you know, uh, Nigel Pack comes here a- as a transfer from K-State. Um, and then you have the traditional recruiting, the Isaiah Wongs of the, of the world, the poplars of the world who came through traditional recruiting, but were not like out of this world, highly ranked prospects like Duke and Carolina are signing every year. So the amazing thing to me is the vision that they have in putting their roster together each season. And you're right. Other than when the FBI derailed them, I mean, they've been at the top three or four of the ACC you know, for a very long time now. And uh, mad applause for Jim Laranega. We are going to cover you as much as we can. We hope we can bring more people onto the bandwagon this year to enjoy this run. We don't know where it's going to end. We don't know if you'll get to the Elite Eight again. But I do know one thing. You are going to go into the NCAA tournament this year as a team that not too many people want to play unless they got some big bullies inside, uh, like that Maryland team that beat them earlier this year. Uh, by essentially bullying them inside. They took advantage of Miami's lack of height, and uh, that will be something that they may have to learn to deal with at some point here along the way. But right now, they are managing to win all these games, and they are looking impressive doing it, Matt. And, you know, just a great job and a great accomplishment. All right, a um, couple other things on the website today. Um, we, are, we have our updated portal tracker. Uh, we're keeping it updated on a daily basis. Players that might uh, might come to the team uh, along the way. Uh, we are expecting a couple visits this weekend. Um, there's a defensive lineman from Arkansas who's in the portal, Isaiah Nichols. We've told you um, that Miami is big time in the market for defensive tackles. There are not a lot of good ones in the portal. And I'm not going to sit here and oversell Isaiah Nichols to you either. Uh, you know, right now they are trying to find serviceable defensive linemen. This is not like, oh, geez, I'm going in the portal for the next All-American defensive lineman at Miami. Uh, this is trying to get the numbers to the right spot, rotation guys. Uh, and that's probably what Isaiah Nichols would be uh, if he chooses to come. And they're also looking at a cornerback. They, they need to keep. Uh, building up the, the defensive backfield. You know the problems they had this past year. Uh, Iowa cornerback Terry Roberts uh, is also supposed to visit this weekend. So um, we'll be continuing to cover that. A um, couple other things uh, we, we've got in the, in the works. Uh, uh, Stephen Wagner is out in San Antonio for the All-American game. So he'll be bringing us coverage from out there. We'll be previewing that coverage as the day goes on. Uh, today, so keep an eye out for that on the website. And um, we've also got our Miami Hurricanes in the NFL Week 17 highlights on the website today as well. So, Matt, I'm, I don't know if you're as happy to be back as I am, uh, but we I just hope that everybody had a great holiday season, got to spend some time with your families, had a great new year. Uh, as always, we appreciate you starting your day out with us on this show. Hit your subscribe button. Hit your like button. It helps us with the algorithms at YouTube. Continue to grow our audience and uh, bring more Canes fans to this show 
every morning. And uh, and just just to wrap up on my end, I'll, I want to give a shout out to Azubi, uh, who's a little under the weather and couldn't join us. And then also um, to Stephen Wagner, uh, who I really appreciate for telling me that I am a Larry David who is not funny. So I do appreciate Azubi. Don't appreciate Stephen. And uh, have a great day, everybody. All right. So I'll say it too. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow.